This morning, I want to share with you on a sermon I've entitled, Living Life on Purpose. Living Life on Purpose. If you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, we're going to read two passages, chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 to 5, and then we're going to turn to Jeremiah 29, and we're going to read verse 11. So Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're going to read from verses 1 to 5. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathon, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Joiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, on to the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, on to the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the, Lord, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet, Unto the nations. Amen. Let's look now at verse of uh, chapter 29. Chapter 29, and we're going to read verse 11. Very popular passage of scripture. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Father, today, we are thankful for another opportunity to look into your word. We ask, O oh God, today in the name of your Son, that you will illumine our understanding. We ask, O oh God, that your word will find good soil and that your word will bring forth fruit. We ask, O oh God, that you will touch our hearts and challenge us to change. That, Lord, we will not be just hearers of the word but will be doers also. Lord, we pray for transformation of life, transformation of heart, that at the end of it all, your name will be glorified and lifted up in this house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Living life on purpose. Living life on purpose. Neuropsychologists tell us that there is something called automaticity. That's where there's a level of automation that takes place. Once you perform a task regular enough, the brain puts that into a particular uh, motion where it's it becomes automatic so that you utilize less of your brain space to perform the same task. Simple things we become very familiar with. For most of you here today, you sit in the same seat every Sunday. <laughs> oh, isn't that true? And if you, if you have been to some place just one time and you have to go back, chances are you're going to look for that same seat. Huh? Things become, we don't think about it, but certain things become very automatic. You put your pants on using the same leg every time. Is that true or not? And if you try to do it otherwise, you lose your balance. When you go home, try it and you'll see what I'm talking about. Automaticity. Let's try another thing. Fold your arms for me right where you are. All right? Very simple task. Now try to fold your arms the other direction. Tell me what's going on there. Huh? Are you struggling to fold your arms? Huh? A very simple task you, you're struggling to do. And if you happen to get it right, it feels so uncomfortable that you would just do what? Go back to what you're accustomed to. That's how we are wired. That's how the brain is wired. And so sometimes we can find ourselves living life in autopilot. We live in our lives. We have a particular routine, and with very little thought, 
we just slip into that routine and we get going. We get going. Automaticity, I think they call it. That's what they call it. But this morning, we are talking about a level of intentionality in living your life. We are talking about living life on purpose. We are talking about a level of consciousness or awareness in terms of how we live our Christian lives. Because it's easy for us to become so comfortable and so settled, as the older folks say, familiarity breeds contempt. And so sometimes even God is treated like a partner. The level of awe and respect that is due unto him. You don't get that often. It's like, you know, God will understand. And we live our lives like that. And then there is the coincidence that we see life as things happening. And we consider them happening by coincidence. Coincidence is defined as a situation in which events happen at the same time in a way that is not planned or expected. So we talk about coincidence. So maybe this message today is just by coincidence Pastor Edison is preaching about. Maybe that's how we see it. Because we see life as happening, these circumstances. Any, any event or circumstance that we are unable to, to piece together, we sometimes see it as having no apparent causal connection. But when we think about the nature and the character of God, we see clearly in Scripture that the God that we serve is a God of purpose. Purpose. And purpose can be defined as the reason for which something exists or the reason for which something is done. It's not by coincidence. There is a level of intended desire, result, goal, end. You are doing something to achieve a particular result. It's not, it didn't just happen by chance. But some kind of intentionality, some kind of deliberate effort or energy was put into the achievement of that thing. And I'm saying to us today that as we look through scripture, we see that God is depicted over and over in scripture as a God of purpose. We in our finite mind may not always understand the purposes of God. But that does not negate that our God is a God of purpose. And church, this is a very important concept for us to understand if we have to attempt to wrap our minds around the sovereignty of God. Because we will not understand why things happen on the earth. We will not understand why bad things happen to good people. But we have to have at least some level of understanding that God is a God of purpose. God is not a God of coincidence or happen chance. But as men, we will not always be able to piece the together. We may not be able to connect all the dots. We will not see the levers and all of the pulleys that are happening behind the scene making things happen. And so sometimes it seems to us as if there is no creativity or causal effect in terms of what's happening. But let me assure you today, God is a God of purpose. In the background of the text, we see that the children of Israel, they had been carried into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible tells us that they had been in exile for, over, for just about 70 years. And in the midst of their situation, I try to imagine what their mindset might have been. I mean, these were people who had seen the mighty delivering hand of God in supernatural ways. From the Red Sea to the conquering of Canaan, you, you, you could imagine the kind of deliverance that they have witnessed at the hands of, them, of their God. And now they're being taken into captivity. I don't know about you, but I could perceive that they might have felt a bit deflated. I could perceive that maybe they had some questions to their God. 
Huh? For some of us, God is providing all the time. And the day that money didn't come on time for that bill, oh God, why have thou forsaken me? We sometimes fail to see the bigger picture when things don't always work our way. But in the midst of their difficult and trying situation, God sends a message of hope. And church sometimes really do need a message of hope. Sometimes we do need to hear somebody whisper in our ear that God has not forgotten. Sometimes when it seems as if that blessing, that prayer request continues to go unanswered. We sometimes need to hear somebody whisper to us a message of hope that God has not forsaken and God has not forgotten. So this message came and the, and the Bible says, the prophet Jeremiah declared, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Well, we're in captivity. But the message of hope is that my plans are not to hurt you. My plans are to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. To give you an expected end, a favorable end. And sometimes we need to hear that. That, that at the end of the day, God's plans are to give you a favorable end. Are you hearing me, church? We may not be able to see it from where we are standing. We may not be able to calculate all the pieces that need to come together to make this a reality. But the word of God says his plans are not to hurt us, but to give us a favorable end, an expected end. And so God had reassured, reassured the children of Israel in the midst of their captivity that he would restore them to their land. At the end of the 70 years, and the Bible declares that God did do what he said he was going to do. But even though the scriptural context was for the children of Israel in Babylonian ca captivity, what it says to you and I today is something about the character of God. The character of God as a God of purpose. A God of purpose. And I want to declare to you today that God knows your destiny. God knows. Have you ever looked at a movie but you knew how it ended? Huh? And it looks hopeless. But you know what the result is. So there's hope as you go through it. There's a sense in which God knows the end before he begins. And so even though we may not be able to see how this is going to play out, what, the, what would the next script look like, we can rest assured that God knows your destiny. He planned it. He planned it. Before you were born, God knew and ordained you that you would be a child of God in the kingdom for such a time as this. He told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, which we, which we already read. He says, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, whether cesarean or otherwise, I sanctified you and ordained you to be a prophet to the nation. Doesn't it feel good to know that you are not here by happen chance? But that before you were even formed in the womb, God knew you. When your parents was trying to figure out what to name this child, God already knew what your name would be. When your parents was trying to figure out, am I really pregnant? God knew you were on your way. Because he had already ordained that you should be here. That's important. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel special. That makes me feel special because I didn't just happen to be here. God organized my birth. He orchestrated. So whether you are the result of a planned pregnancy or otherwise, God planned your birth. God planned that you 
would be here. And not just here, but he has a blueprint that he has ordained for your life. Scripture will give us references that indicate that God had orchestrated even who your parents will be. Where you would be born. The community that you will grow up in. All of these things were orchestrated. But more importantly, your citizenship in the kingdom of God did not happen as a result of God casting some net from heaven and pulling in to see what he has. The scripture informs us that God designed it didn't happen like that. God handpicked you. God purposed that you will be here, that you will be a citizen of the kingdom of God. It was not something that just happened by coincidence. It was all God's design and purpose. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 says it this way. He chose us in Christ even before the foundations of the world. Before he said, let there be and there was, he chose you. So it didn't start in Genesis. It started before. He chose you before the very foundation of the world. The Amplified Version puts it this way. He, he handpicked us out to himself as his very own. Handpicked. You were handpicked. That should make you feel special. It makes me feel special. It says that there is a level of purpose for me being in the kingdom of God. But even though we are handpicked, we continue to live our lives as if our existence is happening chance. When in fact it was that divinely orchestrated. And I'm saying that even though we may not know all the details of God's purpose for us, we should at least have a level of understanding that God has a divinely orchestrated plan for your life. He has wrapped up destiny in you. When you were born, when he created you, he purposed a blueprint to be executed, to come to fruition in the fullness of time. So your salvation wasn't by chance. Why, why won't you say it before? Because of the fullness of time. You came to that place where you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Something tremendous happened in the heavenly realm. There was a translation from one kingdom to another. From the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's son. Something special happened as God has divinely orchestrated. So when we think about our salvation, we need to understand that our salvation is not something that we should take for granted. Our salvation, us having the privilege of being called sons and daughters of God, is not something that we should just take lightly. This is something that God taught about. He had you on his mind. And could I say to you, he still thinks about you. Because his plan is to bring that desired blueprint to fruition. And though many of us are far away from accomplishing God's full purpose, understand that God's plan is to bring you to that fullness in him. That's his desire. Rick Warren in The Purpose Driven Life noted that your purpose in life is greater than your personal ambition. It's greater than your personal fulfillment. So when we want to understand why this doesn't happen this way, it's bigger than your personal fulfillment. It's bigger than your family. It's bigger than your career. God's purpose is bigger than anything we can think about. But for us to begin to appreciate, your life must be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because there's no possible way that I could fathom us walking and fulfilling God's purpose if we fail to even submit ourselves to his divine control. We can't be living life as we would have it and expect to see God's fullness being accomplished in and through us. It just does not work like that. 
God's ways, the Bible tells us, in no uncertain terms, are bigger than our ways. His thoughts are bigger than our thoughts. We will not understand the complexity of God. We will not be able to fathom the love of God and understand his greatness and his wisdom. But we in our finite wisdom will plan our own lives very often in the absence of God. And sometimes we can find ourselves in some very difficult spaces because God had not ordained that you should walk that way. So not only does God know your destiny, but he has a plan to bring that destiny to pass. Now, Brother Jonah learned that the hard way. Huh? Jonah was given very clear and specific instruction. Jonah 1 and verse 2. It says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Very clear instructions. And from this statement, one of the things that stands out to me is that God is against wickedness. Now, we all have our own definition of wickedness, right? And for, for a lot of people, we see wickedness as being malicious and deceptive and hurtful. Huh? So when we see wickedness as being that, you know, well, we're safe. But I see, I see the Lord saying to his people who are called by his name in, 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 in Chronicles to turn from your wicked ways. And the reference is not just talking about being malicious and deceptive and hurtful, but it's talking about immorality, sin. Turn from your sin. Because at the end of the day, a life of sin is considered wicked before the Lord. And so Jonah was given that instruction to go and to preach against Nineveh because their wickedness has come up before me. Sometimes wonder how God sees us as a nation. And I can imagine that he's probably saying the same thing. The wickedness of this nation has come up before me. We are talking about crime, but I believe what we are seeing has a deeper dimension. When we look at the extent and the intensity of the kind of things we are witnessing, it seems to me that there are spirits of wickedness in our land. And sometimes we as preachers can get a bit shy when it comes to declaring the unadulterated word of God against sin and against wickedness. I hear the words of John the Baptist, repent and be baptized. I hear the sermons of repentance going forth. But honestly, we see that in our churches today, there is a moving away for fear of offending because if I preach about hell, hello, then it might make some people uncomfortable. And if I make some people uncomfortable, they may not come back. Or they may withhold the offering and stoops. Huh? Not today. And so there is, a, there is a kind of a pressure that some of our ministers feel in declaring the unadulterated word of God. In calling sin, sin. In saying that he that sinneth, he shall surely die. In saying, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In saying that the wages, the recompense, your salary for sin is death. Well, Brother Jonah was given clear instructions. To go and declare and to preach against Nineveh. Now, Jonah had a different mission. He wasn't afraid to say it. He just felt, if I preach and I declare what God has said, the people might turn from their ways. And God is such a merciful God. Huh? He would forgive them. But as the young people say, fire go burn. So, brother, Jonah had a different plan. And I think we understand the story 
He tried to run away from God. And he was headed for Tarshish. And of course, we know the story. In that journey, the waves, the ship was in problems. And Jonah was thrown overboard. And God preserved him. He was swallowed by a big fish. And he spent three days in the, fish, in the belly of the fish. And then he was spit out on dry land. And he had to come full circle to God's plan. Now what I find very silly about what Jonah did is that he thought in his own wisdom, if I go to Tarshish, then I am running away from the presence of God. But as foolish as we may think it sounds, we sometimes do that. We sometimes think that if we are not in church, movie tongue I'm talking about, then there's a sense in which hmm, there's a freedom sometimes, there's a lack of awareness sometimes of God's presence. Where can you go away that is separate from God? Where can you go from God's presence? David, the psalmist said, if you make your bed in hell, he's there. If you go as far as the east is from the west, he is there. We cannot run from the presence of God. So I see people avoid coming to church because they think they are avoiding the presence of God. We can't avoid the presence of God. When nobody sees you, God is there. But we don't live always with that consciousness that God is ever present. He is. And he expects us to subject ourselves to his divine purpose for us. Jonah thought he can run away from the presence of God. We cannot run away from God's presence. God has given a specific mandate and Jonah had to come full circle to fulfill the perfect plan of God. There are many that come to church every Sunday, hear the word of God, but refuse to surrender themselves to God. In a sense, you are running from God. But can we really run from God? There are many who have grown up in church and have heard the gospel in and out. Can quote scriptures like the back of their hands. But still refuse to bring themselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Trying to run from God. Could we really? Jonah found out the hard way. But God's plans according to scripture is not to harm us. At the end of the day, God doesn't want to hurt you. God want to, wants to give you a good future and an expected end. The problem is that we sometimes think we know what's best for us more than God. And for those of you who are parents will understand what I'm saying. I listen to my children in their own reasoning. And they think they know. They really do. Sometimes there are things that God will prescribe for us to do. That will seem like un it's something uncomfortable for us. And we would run from it. When God in his wisdom is putting that in your place. To make you better. To put you in a better place. To give you strength. To give you the ability to conquer and to overcome. But we maneuver and we think we are doing something. God's plan is not to harm us church. God's plan is not to hurt you. We think that God's plan to surrender myself is like to give up all the joys of life. Huh? You hear young people talk that way. You know, you mean serve God in the fullness? You know, so you mean I can't do the river and the bank and the bank, bank, river, bank? Because there are times when I want to have fun, but this church thing kind of boring. You know, my pastor used to say, if you find church boring, you're too far on the outside. Because if you get a taste of the fullness of God and the sweetness of God, you understand like the songwriter, none can compare. 
You understand that your presence is heaven to me. You understand there is nothing like the presence of God. And I'm not talking about being in church. I am talking about being in the presence of God. There's nothing like fellowship with God. There's nothing like feeling that connection with the creator of the universe and know that he calls you friend. There's nothing like knowing that when you bring your petitions to God, he takes time out. The CEO of the universe takes time out, put calls on hold to listen to what you have to say because you are important to him. That's our God. And his plans are to do good, not to hurt you. We get frustrated. We wonder why nothing seems to be working in our lives. Maybe because we are not submitting to God as we should. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then, then, then all these other things will be added. We have it the other way around. We pursue our stuff and then say, well, God, I have a little time here today. We get mixed up. God says, if you put my will, you put my plan first, stand back and see. All the pieces of your life will begin to come together. All the other things that we worry and stress about, the Bible says, they will be added onto you. God's plan. God's plan is to prosper you. And this is by no means a prosperity sermon. But we need to understand that God's plan is to prosper you. Which father does not want what is best for his children? Hello? Are you there? A loving father would go at any length. To make sure his children have the best. A loving father will sacrifice. Are you hearing me? Will give up certain benefits. To ensure that his children. Would have. No loving father will want to see their child hurting and not be able to help. A true loving father will give a kidney if he has to. Are you hearing me? For your child. Even if that child is a little miserable sometimes. That's your child. Time a picnic. And so you will go the extra for your child. But could we outdo God? Could we outdo God? When I say God's plans are to prosper you, God's plans for you are good. Like any loving father will want to see their children grow up and to become something in life and to be able to sustain themselves and to have a good life, a good future. Hello? Hello? If, if earthly parents will put a child's life in order, begin to plan, begin to put things in place. Huh? Annalise is just about the time of SEA and be trying to make sure she has all the resources she needs. I will go into the bookstore and sometimes I'm buying the same thing twice because I'm so trying to give her all the resources that she could possibly have to do well. Are you following me? You try to make sure that they're exposed to a holistic level of development. You go out of your way. You make the sacrifices because you want to see your children develop holistically and become good citizens. What about God's plan for you? God's plan for you is to prosper you. God wants to see you do well. God doesn't want to see you suffer. God doesn't want to see you go through hardship. Even though that's sometimes part of the journey. Are you following me? Let's strike the balance here. It is sometimes part of the journey. But it's not the end result. At the end, God's plans for you are good. Plans to give you a good future and an expected outcome. 
So God wants to give good things. He said, no good thing will I withhold from him that walk uprightly. No good thing. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 says, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. So just as God wants to give you good plans, sometimes he finds himself competing against you because you sometimes have your own purpose, your own design. And, and we could be so stubborn sometimes, so stubborn. No wonder God calls us sheep. You're putting your head on the same tree over and over. Well, move now. Huh? You, you, you see one sheep fall off the cliff. The next one fall. Where are you going? <laughs> we like sheep have gone astray. Uh, and, and, and we could be so stubborn sometimes. The thing that God has put in place to protect us from ourselves. We violating. We cheating our own selves. God didn't put things in place to harm you or to oppress you. And more and more, society is realizing that when the scripture says, thou shall not, thou shall not, oh, that is why. So God's plan is to bless you. But when you have your own plan, sometimes God frustrates your plans. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. You have your own plans, but God sometimes finds a way to turn things around, to accomplish his purpose in you. Because God is not, trans God is not just seeing what we are seeing right here on earth. God sees beyond this. God is seeing the bigger picture. You have to understand, God dwells in eternity, you know. You know, one second is like a thousand years. So when we get all, all frustrated and worked up, God is seeing the bigger picture. God is thinking eternity. We caught up on whether you have a 50-inch TV or you have a 32-inch. We caught up with all the material things. And, and we, we are so focused and we are so driven after some of the material things. Nothing wrong with having the nice things. I like a big TV too. But I'm saying we can't get caught up with these things. God is looking after your eternal well-being. God is thinking that you are eternal being. At the end of the day, God has placed his spirit in you. And he has given you life and life more abundantly. God is seeing eternal. And so when God orchestrates and designs and puts things in place for your destiny, we're not talking about whether you're going to be a doctor or lawyer, you're going to get your promotion next year. I am talking about your future. I'm talking about your eternal benefit. God is seeing beyond this natural two by four thing that blinds our eyes sometimes. God sees beyond. He is an eternal God. And so we fight against him. Job chapter 5 verse 12 says, He disappoints the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. Sometimes God will frustrate your efforts. Well, Jonah understood that. And sometimes God will frustrate your effort and you ask yourself, why this thing not? To bring you right back to where he wants you. But not only does he want you to prosper, he has given you a hope of a future, a good end, an expected future. God's plans for your future is not limited or confined to this earth. Paul said, if our hope is only in this life, then, then we of all men are most miserable. Most miserable. I have been to funerals of people who have accumulated lots of wealth. It, it's a sad thing to see people die and leave everything behind. And then all kinds of a fighting takes place among the family. Huh? You know, my loving brother and sister, until mommy or daddy dies. And then the bacchanal starts. Yeah? And people being ostracized. Huh? People being disowned. 
over the material things. I'm not saying don't have them, but don't put your hope in them. You're going to leave them behind. God's plan is for, is for a good future. And this future also speaks of his redemptive plan for mankind. It is not his will, the Bible says, that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. That's God's mission. And so as we go through our own sojourn, as we go through our own daily activities, God continues to knock. He continues to point us back to the right way. As we are drifting off even as believers, God continues to say to us, hey, put away malice, put away hatred, put away sin, put away the flesh, put away, reckon it as dead. He continues to come and to push for us to stay on that narrow path that leads to eternal life. He continues by his divine purpose and grace to show you favor that you don't even understand. You're driving and you see, oh, cool, look at that accident. You didn't know that that was orchestrated for you. But God allowed you to be one minute late that morning. And you're quarreling, oh gosh, I'm late. Not understand that it's not about coincidence, but God's divine purpose. And so that late that you are this morning sometimes might have saved you from some plot that the enemy had put in place for you. We don't understand how God does his work. But at the end of the day, God saves us and he continues and he continues to guide and to whisper to us to come to him. I was speaking to someone just a couple days ago. And when you hear the amount of complications, physical complications, this person has had, you know that somehow God isn't ready for him yet. I mean, two heart operations, two, spi I mean, two, eh? two spinal operations, two this, two that. He said to me, I'm on my ninth life. And even though he understands that he, doctors are confused why he's still alive. He said to me, his, his doctor said to him, you are the most complicated case I have ever had. And yet he's alive to tell the story. But in spite of this, there is no acknowledging of the mercies of God. Thank God, God is not like man. God continues to give and extend because he wants his purposes for your life to come to fruition and we continue to push him away. You on your own beat. You have your own plan for your life. God wants to disrupt my plan with this Jesus thing. I don't mind coming to church, but this kind of a commitment you're talking about, I have my own plan. And God continues to preserve you in spite of your rejection because he has a plan for you. And he continues to put things in your path that you could find yourself where you're supposed to be. And like that stubborn mule, we continue to push back. God has a future for you. But we need to surrender and submit ourselves to God's purpose. So what is God's purpose? And we have been talking about equipping over the past couple of weeks, months. And in Bible study, of course, we've been talking about equipping ourselves and understanding God's purposes for our lives. But I want to say that every believer has been gifted, according to Ephesians. No child of God comes empty-handed. Are you hearing me? Every child of God has been gifted. God has given you something that you will need to accomplish that purpose that he's called you to. He does not call you to something without preparing you and giving you all that you need to accomplish that task. And like I've said before, with man, when, a, when a man gets a gift, that's for me. That's my gift. In fact, if you give away a gift, people get offended. Because I bought that for you. 
But when God gives you a gift, it's not for you. When God gives you a gift, it's for the kingdom of God. And you will be held accountable with that gift that you are sitting on. You will be held accountable that God has given something special. Equipped you to accomplish that purpose that he has declared before the foundation of the world. And if we don't find ourselves in God's purpose, we will be held accountable. What is God's purpose? Some believe that your drive helps to give some kind of predictor of God's purpose. Let's just touch on a couple things before we, we wrap up. Success is not purpose. There are many people who in this world will classify success as having accomplished God's purpose. But success is not purpose. There are many successful people who are as the world classifies it, who are outside of God's divine plan for them and for their lives. But the inverse is also true. There are people who the world may classify as unsuccessful, who are right smack in the middle of God's divinely orchestrated purpose for their lives. God doesn't look at the material things. God's definition of success is different to man's definition. So success is not purpose. Your gifts that God has given are to be used to accomplish your purpose. God has equipped, I mentioned before, and given you abilities. And those abilities and giftings are, be, are to be used to accomplish his purposes on the earth. Thirdly, your purpose will drive you. I mentioned some people see drive and desire as some of the predictors of God's purpose. So if I could understand where your drive and your desire really is, then maybe God's purpose for you is locked somewhere within that sphere. So sometimes you would see God will put a burden in your heart. For some people, God will put will birth something in you. You feel impregnated with something to, to accomplish. Are you following me? It might be a ministry that we don't have. But God has put something in you to do and you feel that burden to accomplish it. And I'll tell you this, sometimes when you don't do it, you feel so uneasy. Because I just must do this. And people around you may not understand it makes no sense. Why are you doing this? You don't need to do this. Why are you doing this? But for you, there's a comp you feel compelled to do this thing. I can't explain it, but there's a drive. Maybe your purpose is locked somewhere within that, 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 that drive. Nothing is wasted in the achieving of God's purpose for your life. God will use even the pain and the hurts that you've been through. God will use even all the negative things in your life to accomplish his divine purpose for you. Does God initiate these traumatic experiences? No. But in spite of those traumatic experiences, he will safely navigate you through them. And he will take that experience and he will use it in accomplishing. Nothing is wasted with God. Sometimes even when you go off course and you make a double run when it could have just taken you a couple minutes. God will take all of what we call wasted time. All of the other areas and things you might have been involved in that minute have lined up. God will take will take all that you are, all of your experiences, even the negatives, and he will use it to accomplish his greater purpose in your life. Acts chapter 13 verse 22 says, God raised up David to be king. Of him he bore witness and said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will and carry out my purpose. Time will not allow, but if we understand the life of David, 
you would know it wasn't always an easy navigation towards where he is. Being called a man of God, they were a man after God's own heart. There were lots of rocky, in, uh, rocky times that he's been through. Lots of ups and downs. Lots of difficult periods he's been through in his life. But God would have used all that he, that he is to make him who he become. So the question here as we close is, can God depend on you to carry out his purpose? I don't understand God, but he has chosen to use men. Honestly, I don't think he had to. But he chose to use men. He chose to use men who are frail, weak, sinful. He chose men who were formed from the dust of the ground. We struggle. Huh? We, we, we understand our frailty and yet God says, you're perfect for what I want to do. He's chosen to use men. But the question is, can he depend on you? Can he depend on you to accomplish his purpose on the earth? And wherever we are, we are all in a position of influence to accomplish something for God. Can he depend on you? 2 Timothy 1.9 says, God has saved us and called us for a purpose. Your salvation is not just to be heaven bound. One man said, otherwise God would have taken you right after he saved you. But it's not just about being on the bus that leads or that train that leads to glory. It's about accomplishing God's purpose. Acts chapter 13 and verse 36 went on to say, For David, after he had served God's will and purpose in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried among the fathers. He completed his purpose. Paul, at the end of his days, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, 8, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is the prize that awaits me, the crown of righteousness. Are you in God's purpose? Are you on your own beat? Are you where you are supposed to be? Or are you taking a chance to do your own thing? God's plan is not to hurt you. We are running away from what we're supposed to be running to. Because we think if I totally surrender and commit, I'm going to lose. You are not going to lose in this equation. Are you in God's purpose? Could you stand with me right where you are?